Aren't you thankful God didn't sign you up for salvation and send you out into the world and go, I hope it goes okay. He didn't do that. He saved you. He filled you with the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. That you go into the world with his strength to stand strong. You go into the world with his power on your life. You go into the world with his covering and with the wind of the Spirit at your back. You're not alone. Jesus is with you. And that's how you stand strong. Jesus is with you. Today we're back in our series, Stand Strong, from the book of Hebrews, and I don't know about you, but I have just loved this series. Have you loved Stand Strong, how good it's been, how encouraging it's been, how it's pointed us to Jesus? And you know, as we've been walking through this book, we've noticed some things, some themes that run through the book, and today as we get to chapter four, I want you to remember where we've been, and that is that there are a number of warnings that are in the book of Hebrews, and for the last two weeks, we've talked about the danger of unbelief. But today, as we move toward Hebrews chapter 4, the writer doesn't just want us to know what happens if we don't put our faith in Jesus. He wants us to understand what happens when we do. The difference that it makes, and what you miss out on if you don't know Jesus. And so today, as we come to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14, I want to talk to you from the subject that Jesus has everything you need. You know what? This summer, the family took a trip to Alaska. So we packed up the kids, and we were going to see a bunch of national parks in Alaska. And it was so, they were so excited. I mean, just so excited. And we used Anchorage as our base of operations for our little adventure. And so we got a hotel in the middle of the city and we rented a car and we checked into the hotel and it was late at night. If you've ever been to Alaska in the summer, you know that it's it's daylight all day, like even in the middle of the night. So we roll in, it's like close to midnight and it's a little, that's actually kind of a little bit creepy. Um, You know, I don't even know, I'm disoriented. So we get in there, we're unpacking, but the the hotel is a ghost town because it's so late. And so we get all the kids and all their luggage. We've got four kids, by the way, ages 14 down to seven. So there's a lot going on. And so we get into the room and Owen, our oldest, as we're unpacking close to midnight says, daddy, can I take the cart down? And we actually had two, and I said, that would be a blessing. I would love you. Like, I love you. I wouldn't love him for doing that. I love him already. But I said, I would love that. And so he, he proceeded to do that, and we started getting the kids into their jammies and, and kind of just getting them ready for bed. And, you know, you're kind of in the chaos and craziness of that, setting up the hotel room, because we all, we're all bunking in one room. It's just, it, you know, guerrilla warfare in Alaska. So, um, so we're trying to get everybody set up. And you know, I looked down at my watch and realized he's been gone for about five minutes. Well, that's that's kind of odd. So I said to Becky, I, I think I need to go and check on Owen. So I go down to the lobby, and nobody's down there besides the clerk. And I said, Ma- ma'am, I, I'm looking for a, a blonde kid. He's about this tall. And he said, he just brought some carts down. She said, sir, nobody's been down here. Oh, that's odd. Uh, I said, are you sure? She said, who are you looking for? I said, well, he, he's, a, he's a teenage boy. And she said, well, maybe he went to the pool. I said, you know what? I've got kids who would go to the pool in the middle of the night. He ain't one of them. Like, that's not his way. Uh, he's re- pretty responsible. But I said, just for grins, I'll go check. So I went and checked the pool. I checked the bathrooms, nothing. So I, I thought, well, maybe I missed him. So I went back up to the room. And I opened the door to the room, and I could immediately see in Becky's eyes, he's not back. So now it's been, you know, eight, nine minutes. I didn't see him on the way up. I didn't see him on the way down. So I just closed the door real quick because I didn't want to alarm her. And I thought, well, I'll take the stairs. And so I, I, I go down the stairs and I, I look in each floor, you know, doorway down the hall and don't see him. And I get back down to this thinking, you know, he and I just missed each other. And so I talked to the clerk and, and I said, ma'am, do you remember me? I was just down here about three minutes ago. Um, and I said, I'm looking for a, she said, sir, I haven't seen him. And at that point, I'm a little, I'm a little worried. Um, so we're in a city he doesn't know, in a hotel we've never been to. It's just odd. 
And I count the carts, and uh, he, it's just, I, I don't even know how many carts they had. I don't know why that would help, but I'm just like, <laughs> I'm just grasping for straws, you know? And so I, I circle the whole hotel. Nothing. I go back up the stairs. I pray, Lord, he, I need him to be in this room. And I open the door, and Becky bursts into tears. And um, if you've ever lost a child, like, you know what that feels like. And um, so we all go back down together and they haven't seen him. And, and I call the police and we file a missing persons report and, you know, hair color and eye color and shoe size. And, um, and we, we gather around and we pray. And then the clerk says, you know, we've got about three people on the clock right now. Um, what if we, what if we send them around and we'll have people look outside and people look upstairs. And, and so I said, that would be great. And so they do that. And about three minutes later, one of the guys walks into the lobby with Owen. And Becky was like, where have you been? You know, like, <laughs> uh, you know, only a mom, you know, mama bear. Uh, she was not happy with him. Um, and he got confused about what floor we were on. So he just kind of kept missing one another. But I'll tell you this, that in that moment, I was incredibly thankful for people who said, we'll help you with what you need most. I was incredibly thankful for that hotel staff saying, you know what, we see what you need and we'll help you. And today we come to three verses in which the writer of Hebrews wants us to understand something about Jesus. And that is that Jesus has everything you need. He has everything you need. I don't know what you need, but he's got it. He has everything you need. And the verses we're going to look at point us to that reality in three ways. But first, let's read them together. Hebrews 14 or 414. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. The first way the writer of Hebrews points us to Jesus having everything we need is that Jesus gives you the strength to stand strong. The whole book of Hebrews is about standing strong, but the writer wants you to understand as we get to chapter four and the end of chapter four, that Jesus gives you the strength to stand strong. And here's the reality. We can all need a lot of things, okay? Life is filled with moments where you find yourself in need, but what we need more than anything else is strength in our walk with God. You need a strong walk with God. You need to be spiritually strong. That's more important than anything else in your entire life. And the writer of Hebrews hints at this priority by his word choice. Because when you look at verse, verse 14, it says, since then we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. That word hold fast is a very unique word in Greek. It's the Greek word kratain. And kratain means to hold with all your might. Have you ever held something with all your might? I mean, you just, you were, you were shaken. I'm shaking and I'm not holding anything. You know, like you were, you were just, I mean, white knuckled. That word can also mean to arrest. I mean, just hanging on. Why would the writer of Hebrews use that kind of intense language to talk about holding on to our confession. He says, I want you to hold on, hold fast, hold with all your might, hold as if your life depended on it to your confession. And to understand why he would say that, you have to understand what the confession is. And I realize we have a lot of church backgrounds in the room, across the campuses, and confession can mean a lot of different things to different religious traditions and even Christian traditions. But confession here has a very specific meaning. In fact, the writer, the pastor, the theologian, John Owen, writing about 400 years ago, he wrote six volumes on the book of Hebrews, about 3,000 pages of commentary. He says that word confession signals two things. 
It signals our faith in Christ and our obedience to Christ. So in other words, your confession is not just a confession of faith in the sense of a doctrinal statement or a statement of beliefs or, you know, what kind of what you hang on to or how you define your understanding of Christianity. You need to know what you believe. Those are very important. We have a doctrinal statement, you know, a statement of faith you can find on the website. We teach that statement of faith in the grow track. All of that is very, very important, but you need to understand something. Just as important as what you believe is, it's as important what you do with what you believe. Okay? Believing something is great, but it a better affect your living, right? Because we don't just believe it, we live it. That's why James says what he does in James chapter 2. Faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So you can say, you know what? I believe the Bible is God's word. Wow, what an awesome belief. Do you live it? Do you read it? Okay, it's God's word. Do you read it with the expectation that God is going to speak to you every time you open it? Because I believe the Bible is God's word is a great statement. It's even better when you live that statement. You can say, you know what? I believe I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit, that God lives on the inside of me. Powerful. That's awesome. Do you live like everywhere you go, he goes? Everything you listen to, to, he listens to. Everything you watch, he watches. Everything you do, he's right in the middle of. So I believe. That's awesome. I believe God heals powerful. That's an awesome declaration of faith. Here's what I would ask you. Every time you see the sick, you see the hurting, somebody who's got an injury, does faith well up in your heart to say, oh, I believe God wants to do a miracle through me right here, right now. Is that the way you live? Because a statement of faith is great, but a life of faith is better. But all of us would admit at every single campus, we would admit this, That it's difficult to live every day and every moment with that level of consistency of conviction. It's hard to do. It's hard to do. Which is why the writer of Hebrews says what he does at the beginning of verse 14. Look at this. Since then we have. Here's the problem. That a lot of Christians are trying to live the Christian life forgetting what they have. You have something that's at the center of your walk with God that radically changes the way you live the life of faith if you are cognizant of what you have. Okay, so what do you have? Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. The writer is going to keep calling Jesus our high priest. He called him that in chapter 2. He called him that in chapter 3. He calls him that in chapter 4. He'll call him that in chapter 5. He's going to continue to come back to Jesus as our high priest. Why? Because a high priest represented the people before God. In the Old Testament and in the sacrificial system, the high priest was an intermediary that he brought sacrifices into the temple to make atonement for the sins of people, that he brought their frailty and their weakness and their inability to deal with their sin and their sin itself. He brought that and he sacrificed for them in their place for their sin, but that sacrificial system would never fully and finally deal with sin. But the writer of Hebrews says, We don't just have a high priest in Jesus. We have a great high priest. Why is he the great high priest? Well, he's the great high priest because he, like the Old Testament high priest, represented us before God. That he stood in our place, that he lived a perfect sinless life, that he died a death on the cross in your place for your sin. He didn't offer a sacrifice. He was the sacrifice. Jesus is the great high priest because There's never going to need to be another sacrifice or another high priest. 
And not only did he die as a sacrifice in your place for your sin, but he passed through the heavens. What he's saying is he rose in victory over Satan's sin and death, and he ascended to heaven, and he's seated in glory at the right hand of the throne of the Father, and he's interceding for you right now. Right now, the Son of God in glory is thinking about you. Right now, the Son of God in this moment at 941 on Sunday morning, Central Standard Time is interceding for you. That's what he's doing. He's the great high priest. So let's go back to the question. Okay, how do I hold fast to my confession every day? How do I live what I say I believe? How do I do that with consistency? How do I do that without failing or faltering? Here's how you do it. You do it with Jesus' help. He says, since we have a great high priest, guess what? God didn't ask you to do it on your own. Aren't you thankful God didn't sign you up for salvation and send you out into the world and go, I hope it goes okay. He didn't do that. He saved you. He filled you with the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. That you go into the world with his strength to stand strong. You go into the world with his power on your life. You go into the world with his covering and with the wind of the Spirit at your back. You're not alone. Jesus is with you. And that's how you stand strong. Jesus is with you. So he gives you the strength to stand strong, but that's not all. He also gives you the confidence to come close. This is so good. The confidence, I'm like, I'm telling myself it's so good. I don't know if that's a good thing, but I'm, I'm loving the way I'm preaching, so I'm just going to do it. He gives you the confidence to come close. Come on, David, preach it. So in verse 14, the writer told us what we have. We have a great high priest. Now in verse 15, he tells us what we don't have. Catch this. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. Let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. To many people, God seems distant. Many people view God that way. He seems aloof. He seems detached. And can I tell you, nothing could be further from the truth. Jesus Christ's identity as the Son of God, his transcendence and his glory does not mean he doesn't understand the realities of your life. It doesn't mean that he stands distant and far off from the struggles you're facing right now at the North Campus. It doesn't mean that as a single mom who's walked into this service, he doesn't know the struggle, he doesn't know the difficulty, he doesn't know what life is like for you. Jesus, as the Son of God, understands. He knows because he wasn't just and isn't just fully God. He's fully God and fully man. He's fully God and fully man. In fact, the writer of Hebrews says he isn't unable to sympathize with us in our weakness, but he is one who in every respect has been tempted as we are. Now, there's a little bit of a problem with the translation here in this sense that English fails us here. Because the Greek word for tempted is, it carries a different weight and significance than the English word for tempted. Because in English, if I said you're being tempted, we would think encouraged to sin. M much more limited focus. But in Greek, this, this word tempted means endured everything. Endured everything we endured. That everything you face, he faced. That everything you're dealing with, he's already dealt with. And yet I realize there are some in the room and you're thinking, you're thinking, well, okay, David, he's dealt with everything, everything I faced. He never had the boss I have. And that is hard. He never had the marriage I have. Jesus wasn't even married. 
He never went through bankruptcy. He never had cancer. He never went through a divorce. He never dealt with a miscarriage. He's never done or dealt with any of those things. So how can he have endured? How can he have gone through everything that I have? And here's what you have to understand about life. And all of this, all of us would readily admit this, that there is the external specifics of any trial, any difficulty, any experience, and then there's the internal core. And those experiences that I named, along with a myriad of others, are different on the surface, but internally, they create the same storm. Unfulfilled longing, alienation, loneliness, angst, anxiety, the sense that you've been abandoned by God. All of those trials, all of those difficulties can create those same realities on the inside. And nobody has experienced alienation like Jesus did. Nobody's experienced loneliness like Jesus did. Nobody's been abandoned like, by God like Jesus was. Look at Isaiah 53, verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. The specifics of your struggle might be different, but the reality of what you are facing is something your Savior has already endured. It's, he's already felt it. He's already carried it. He's already been on his knees in the Garden of Gethsemane, sweating blood. He's, always, he's already been on the cross saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's endured everything you've endured and more. He's endured more than the worst sufferer in this room. He's endured more than the worst sufferer on this planet and in the history of the world. He's been tempted, but not just tempted. He's been tried. He's endured. He's been through everything that you've been through, but without sin. He, was, he never responded in impatience. He always responded with Long-suffering and patience. He responded with love. He responded with grace. He responded with mercy. He responded with power. Even in the moments of his greatest difficulty, Jesus responded perfectly. And even as I say that, now somebody's going, okay, well, oh, well, okay, on the first one you got me, but if he's never sinned, and we've all sinned, he's never had the experience of sinning, so how can he be sympathetic to a sinner? And the writer of Hebrews is going to say some things in this. He's saying some things in this verse. And without sin is a major part of saying, of him telling us why Jesus is perfectly suited to sympathize with you. Because Jesus' sinlessness is just as important to his perfect sympathy as his experiencing everything we've experienced. Why? Well, I'm guessing we have some counselors across the campuses, counselors in the room. But all of us have had the experience of somebody coming to us to tell us their problems. If I, if I asked for a show of hands, it'd be 100%. Somebody came to you and they're telling you their problem. What makes it hard for you to enter in to somebody else's problem? It's not that you can't relate to them. It's not that you don't care. It's not that you're disinterested. You want to know what makes you unable at the deepest level to fully enter in to what they're bearing their soul about? It's your sin. Because sin at its core is self-centeredness. Sin at its core is self-pity. Sin at its core is you going, okay, I know how, I know, I know what I'm dealing with, and I'm going to try really hard to get my attention for three seconds off myself so I can deal 
and help you. But the fact of the matter is, sin makes it impossible for you to fully, unreservedly sympathize with that person. You might want to, you might try as hard as you're able to, and you might do a pretty decent job, but at the end of the day, you cannot fully enter into their hurt. You can't fully enter into their pain. You can't fully enter into their trial. You can't fully enter into their suffering, but you know who can? Jesus. Why? Because he has no sin. The self-centeredness that plagues the human condition doesn't plague him. So when you're hurting and when you're struggling, you know where the best place and the best person to take your sin is? Jesus. You know where to take your trial? Jesus. Why? Because he's perfectly able to sympathize with you. Because, and here's the thing, you know what keeps a lot of people from drawing close to God? It's because they think God is too busy for them. They think God is tired of them. They have this view of God that when they've messed up or when they've failed or they're walking through a struggle or they're walking through a trial, that they show up on the doorstep of heaven and God goes, oh, you again. Do you, do you, do you know how long this is going to take? Because, I mean, last time it was like days. So if we could make it minutes, that would be great. We've got this view of God that he's watching the clock. We've got this view of God that when we show up with a problem, we're an annoyance to him. We're an inconvenience to him. That he's got so many bigger problems. I mean, he's got a war in Israel to deal with, and he's got famine in Africa to deal with, and he's got a border crisis and a government that it needs help, and you know, he's got all these things. Why would he be interested in you? Why? The writer of Hebrews says, Jesus, he experienced everything that you've experienced, but he doesn't have any of the sin that eats up sympathy. What kills sympathy is sin. And Jesus had none of it. And Jesus says, I understand you. I understand what you've been through. And I not only understand you, I want to walk through life with you. And on that basis, you can come close. And on that basis, you should never for one second think God doesn't have time for you. God's not available to you. Because when you seek him, he will be found, church. You will find him in the darkest valley, in the dead of night, when you've fallen again and again and again and again, and you think God doesn't want to hear from you. He says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus gives us the confidence to come near, to draw close. And not only does he want you to come close, this is astounding. He wants to help you. He wants to give you the help you need. He doesn't just want to hang out with you. He wants to resource you. He doesn't want to hang out, just hang out with you. He actually wants to practically, physically, tangibly, miraculously, supernaturally meet your needs. Look at verse 16. This is so powerful. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Whatever time, whatever need, whatever situation you're facing, Jesus actually wants to help you. I don't know what your need is today. It could be relational. It could be an issue at work. It could be financial struggle. It could be a son or a daughter. It could be a business deal that's gone bad. Jesus says, if you'll draw near, you're going to find help. I'm going to help you. I'm, I'm actually going to help you. I want to help you. Here's what you need to understand about this verse. When it says... Let us then with confidence draw near. This, this phrase that we translate draw near, in Greek, it's in the imperative. Meaning, God is commanding you to get help from him. It's not a suggestion. God actually intended you in creating you to need divine intervention. You need divine intervention. You're not meant to do life on your own. 
I don't care how strong you are, how self-reliant you are. God looks at you and sees you and says, oh, you need a lot of help. Oh, whew, a lot of help. And I want to help you. God wants to help you. In fact, the Bible again and again calls God our helper. He wants to help you. He wants to come to your aid. He wants to meet you at your point of need. Look at the psalmist, what he says. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. I love that phrase, very present. He's not just present in your life. He's very present. In your suffering, he's very present. In your situation, oh, he can be very present. Very present. Look at the next one. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. He'll protect you. He'll defend you. He'll walk with you. He'll cover you with his presence and his power. He's your helper. Psalm 54, behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. Then look at this one. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? Can I ask you, where are you looking for help? Are you looking for it from the bank? Are you looking for it from a family member? Are you looking for it from a bank account with a certain number in it? There's nothing wrong with us helping one another. That's great. But where do you primary look, primarily look for your help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. In other words, he doesn't just want to help you, but he's equipped to help you with whatever you need. He made heaven and earth. There's nothing he can't do. There's no problem too big. He wants to help you. There was a soldier sitting outside the White House, and he was crying. And a little boy saw him and he walked up to him and he said, what's wrong? And the soldier said, you know, I, I came to see the president, but I can't get in. And the boy looked at him and said, yeah, it's hard to see the president, but come on. And he grabbed his hand and the soldier stood up and they walked past the guardhouse and nobody said anything to him. And they walked through the White House lawn and nobody stopped them. And they walked into the foyer of the White House. Nobody said anything. And they walked into the Oval Office up to President Lincoln and the, the boy said, Dad, this man would like to talk to you. That's a true story. Do you realize that no matter what you need, Jesus will take you by the hand and walk you up to the throne of grace and say, Father, this person needs your help. They need to talk to you. This is why prayer should be the first thing on your agenda every day. Prayer is our first response, not our last resort. Why? Because the Son of God made a way. Prayer was purchased at a price. It's not a luxury, it's a necessity in the life of faith. This is why the prayer meeting should be a priority every week, week in and week out. Why? Because we are gathering together for an audience with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and heaven will bend its ear to God's people. It'll happen. It'll happen. Every child of God has an advocate, Jesus Christ, our great high priest. He's enthroned in glory, but he wants to walk with you. But the only way you get his help, listen to this, the only way you get his help, oh, he wants you to stand strong. He wants to give you confidence to walk close to God. He wants to help you, but the only way any of that happens in your life is if you know him. 
the only one who can walk you into the throne room of grace to stand before the Father and say, this person wants to talk to you is Jesus. You have to know Jesus. You have to know Jesus. Some of you are away from God. You have to know Jesus. Some of you think he doesn't want you. Oh, you have to know Jesus. Some of you think he's disinterested. You've gone through and too far, done too much. You've sinned too much. Oh, he's the great high priest who made atonement for sin so that you could be right with God. You have to know Jesus. You have to know Jesus. There's no other way. And the good news is, he wants to know you. He wants to know you. Because when the Bible says he wants to meet your need, the first need, the greatest need, the most important need he can meet in any person's life is the need to be right with God. And you can't do it on your own, and you will never measure up. But Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But oh, if you come to me, I will in no way cast you out. If you will come to him, if you'll say, God, help me. Jesus, I want to know you. He will radically transform your life. And he will introduce you to a life of walking with God where you have the help of heaven every moment of every day. Thank you so much for joining James River Church on our YouTube channel. Our prayer is that you were encouraged and your faith was strengthened today. And we wanna let you know that we'd love for you to be a part of our online family. As well, we'd love if you subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell for notifications. You'll be so glad you did because we're always putting out great sermons, new worship content, and it helps you know when we go live for our weekly services. We hope you have an amazing day and thank you again for watching. God bless.